Fidelity Management, a research company, has urged the Financial Stability Board to abandon a plan that singles out too big to fail investment funds. Here to share insight on whether such a move is a regression or a step forward for the financial community, Dr. Pippa Malmgren. So the big lesson out of 2008, of course, was that the state could not afford to allow the financial community to sort of run amok and create all of these forces that led to the problems that we are still facing in many ways today. But the fact that these big players in the marketplace are calling on the regulators, really bullying them out of trying to scale back. Does it speak to an arrogance that sort of still exists in the financial community? Well, I think it's even more complicated than that. The first thing is, so when I worked in the White House, I was actually you know, on the working groups. And when we heard the plan was that government would be able to identify the risky elements in the markets, we all burst out laughing because, you know, if you can't identify it in the market, how are you going to identify it sitting in a, an office in the West Wing? So government has no capacity to anticipate which firms are going to have a problem. That's the first thing. So in that sense, Fidelity is right. There's no way government can pick and choose who's going to be a winner and who's going to be a loser. Second thing is, we have experienced now the too big to fail. What we haven't experienced is too big to save. And this is the issue you have with sovereign debt. Maybe Greece is a good example. It may be too big to save, even though people think of it as small, but as a sovereign, that's a big mm -hmm, amount mm -hmm. of, of money. The second issue, which I think nobody is talking about, is too small to save, where we have a multitude of small interconnections between small balance sheets, and there are ways in which that can go awry. I mean, for example, the bond market is starting to sell off, right? And people think we have volatility now, everybody's screaming, oh my goodness. Yeah, this is nothing compared to what we've seen in the past where you can be limit down three days in a row. In that world, how many entities fail? And are there too many and are they too small to save? But let's talk about the social contract. You mentioned that in the book and the responsibility that governments have to citizenry. Do you think by intervening, restrictive capital as well as liquidity standards, does that mean that they're doing enough or are they over-easing in some yeah, ways? Well, I am in the camp of they have over-eased. But the key issue is something an economist from the last century I identified, a guy called Knut Vixel of Swede, who said the interest rate is an instrument of justice that balances the interest between the savers and the speculators. And when government tilts it, which they have done deeply in favor of the speculators against the interests of the savers, it has social consequences. And this is exactly what we're in right now. The beneficiaries are benefiting big time. And the people on the other side, the savers or the people with low income, they get hurt. Because after all, the whole point of the exercise is to create a higher cost of living, which I would argue is starting to unfold, especially hitting the poor. So when you talk about you know this distressingly interconnected financial system still exists, if there's problems, for instance, in derivatives, we're talking about the American system, right? When those interconnections exist and there is a disease in one part of the system. Do you think that that is going to continue to prevail and that's going to lead to a breakdown in the same manner that we saw in 2008? Or are there enough stops and starts that have been put in place by the central banks, again using the American example, to really be able to transcend any chaos? So I would say, in fact, we have more complexity today than we had during the last financial crisis. And nothing really has changed, except we've enhanced the belief that government can fix anything. If they're not going to be our saviors, let's talk about what the central bank can actually do moving forward, right? What financial tools would you, if given the opportunity to to be at the helm yourself, what would you put in place in the US? Well, let me say what I think they're going to do as opposed to what I would prefer. What I think we're going to see is much more intervention by government in the form of capital controls, for example. We thought that was isolated to that one incident in Cyprus. Now we hear capital controls for Greece. I think we're going to hear capital controls. And throughout history, normally governments do control the amount of money you can move in and out of a country. Taxation is another kind of a break on economic activity, definitely taxation is becoming more aggressive. So that's another way. 
Regulation is another brake. A brake is in to stop the speed at which this thing flies. And we're definitely seeing governments becoming vastly more aggressive in the regulatory infrastructure. Now, are all these things enough to stop a catastrophe or a terrible accident? I would argue no. But governments feel they can slow down the speed of things. But I'm not so sure. In a world that's got financial markets driven by algorithms and high volume trading, high frequency trading, I think we really don't know whether these brakes can slow it enough.